Causes of the crisis. I think um, um, to understand the crisis, first of all, we have to understand what is money. And money, it's not um, an economic tool. It's not only a medium of exchange uh, between uh, different people that do economic transactions. Money is essentially um, social relations and social relations between uh, creditors and debtors. If we understand money from this point of view, as a, a unit of account that is set by a political authority and uh, that is set by um, a struggle between different social groups and, and therefore power plays a, a big important role, then uh, we can understand the crisis better. Because the construction of the euro was um, uh, set up on the premise that um, uh, money is just a neutral veil in the operations of the economy. And so it is neutral and therefore there is no political interference. And they went so far, the, the constructors of the, of the euro went so far that they wanted to delink the euro from any nation state, from any political interference. Therefore, they didn't allow the European Central Bank or, or any other institution in Europe to kind of um, finance, give uh, credit to the nation states. Essentially, the no bailout clause, so called, uh, doesn't allow the states or the central banks of the states to finance the debt of the states. So the states, they need to get their credit from the financial markets, from the international investors. That means that the, the power balance between the states, in this case the debtors, and the international investors is in favor of the international investors because the states, they have to rely on the financial markets to get their credit because there is no other political authority that can function as the lender of last resort. This is a fundamental role in a central bank that you have the lender of last resort in the, uh, in, in, in the relationship between the state and the, and the central bank. So we had a construction that was a monetary union without a political union behind it. And this is fundamental because, of course, this construction uh, is in favor of international investors. Because international investors, they see that there is no uh, a, a power of the states or actually finance their own debt. And therefore, the euro became a very attractive currency. There was huge demand for the euro. And in an era where the, the, the dollar is a weak currency because of the huge deficits of the United States, then international investors, they are looking for alternatives. And the, the euro was a very attractive alternative because there was no link between the currency and any political interference. Uh, therefore, the euro became a very attractive currency and we see that you have an appreciation of the euro since 2002 to 2008 of 85 percent. So the euro becomes a very strong currency. What does this mean? What is the consequence of this? This means that, for example, if you come from Spain and you look at how Spain had to live with a very strong euro, that means that uh, Spanish products are not very competitive outside and internally as well they lose in markets because essentially all the other countries that have weaker currencies they can export to, to, to Spain, Spain imports and um, so the, the kind of the manufacturing uh, base of Spain is undermined. So you have then a very strong euro, very attractive euro and that means that interest rates that the state of Spain needs to pay are very low. So before 2007 you could see that the spreads what the states need to pay for their debt between Spain, Ireland, Greece and Germany were very narrow. That means that there was so much interest, demand for euro denominated debt that the, the, the credit that the Spanish state had to pay was very low. That meant that the state could borrow cheaply that companies could borrow cheaply and that household could borrow cheaply. So if you combine both things, you have a strong euro that you can buy a lot of products from around the world and you have cheap credit that is an incentive to consume a lot. And that's what uh, Spanish people were doing in the sense of they were able to buy a lot of products from around the world, especially from Germany. And there was a real estate bubble because credit was so cheap, 
a lot of people they wanted to to um, uh, uh, buy houses and you have a real estate bubble and of course um, there is then the link between the creditors and the debtors to actually finance this construction boom in Spain they now had to create credits and these credits came from uh, countries with surpluses mainly Germany and but as well France that they were in, investing in Spain and Spanish people household companies were getting kind of credits from, from, from these countries. This is all fine in the sense of essentially that's how a monetary union should operate. But this is the key question here. When you have this imbalance, so you have Spain that has a huge deficit because it imports a lot, and you have Germany that because it is so highly competitive and can live with the euro at 150, even at 160 to the dollar, is exporting a lot, and German investors are putting a lot of money in Spain and are selling a lot of goods to, to, to the Spanish market, you have an imbalance, a huge imbalance within the monetary union. And once you have this imbalance, it is what is called an asymmetric shock. If you have a huge crisis like the subprime crisis in the United States and the collapse of Lehman Brothers, you have a shock in the system. And then of course the situation is that these surplus countries are better off, they are stronger to resist the shock and countries like Spain that have huge deficits not in the public sector because the Spanish public sector was actually saving a lot of money during the boom times so it was not a problem of the public sector the public sector was saving during the, 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 the good times it was more that the low credit coming from the European Central Bank and the strong euro incentivized people to to invest or to, to buy houses, etc. So you have this asymmetric shock. And the flaw that I explained at the beginning, that the euro is a monetary union without a political union behind it, comes now to the forefront. Because you don't have a federal budget that is necessary in a monetary union, you don't have a federal budget to overcome this asymmetric shock, to overcome the problems that I have now the Spanish, because they have high unemployment and they need to pay their, 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 their debts back, so they need to have some sort of liquidity. It is, so there's a liquidity problem because they need to pay back their debt. If you don't have that, and this is the problem that we have in, right now in, in Europe, you have weak links, and these weak links start with Greece, with Ireland, and go to Portugal, and then Spain and Italy are the next links. So speculators, they are attacking the euro because they see that behind the monetary union, there is no political authority, there is no political support, and there is no player that can lend as the, the, the lender of last resort that the European Central Bank should do. The European Central Bank is only giving credit to the banks, but it is not giving sufficient liquidity to the states. And the question is, should not the European Central Bank, like it is now starting to do, have intervened previously, in the sense that you need to have a central political authority in Europe that can over Christ, or overcome this, this crisis. That's why people are calling for Eurobonds, are calling for, for that you have a centralized budget where you can intervene in, 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 the, in the bond markets of the different states. Now, because the crisis went so far, now they are starting to do it. But they should have done it much, much, much earlier. Now they, they have learned the lesson that without a centralized political uh, a federal budget and uh, uh, um, the uh, central bank or, or in this case a uh, uh, um, 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 uh, fund, a European fund that can intervene in these markets to burn some of the speculators, you will have always uncertainties in the, in, in, in the structure. What are the, the future scenarios that we can see from, the, from, from this crisis? Um, in this um, uh, uh, seminars that we were having here at the ENA, we were working with three possible scenarios. One scenario is that you have the exit from several, several countries that they want to exit the euro. But this is very disruptive because one, you will have to devalue your currency. Secondly, once you devalue, you will import inflation. A lot of goods that you want to import will be much more expensive. So what you win with your devaluation you lose with the inflation and then you, unless you, you introduce capital controls, you will have a lot of people that want to put their money 
outside their countries because of course their money is in euros if there's an introduction of a new currency the old drachma the old peseta the old lira people would lose in their value so you will have a run on the banks and people will try to to, to send the money outside of their current their country so we have then the second scenario the second scenario would um, consist of creating a virtual uh, unit of clearance similar to the previous ECO, the, the European currency unit and you would have then the reintroduction of the national currencies in all the member states so you would have still um, different exchange rates between the member states but when there is trade between them you would operate with this virtual eco money that would be central in, 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 at the European level. And this is an idea that was taken from, from Keynes' um, idea of the banker. And um, he proposed exactly to keep the national currencies, but when it comes to operating between the different nations, to have the eco as the, the currency. And um, the interesting um, um, idea there is that um, surplus countries and deficit countries, if they go too much in surplus or if they go too much in deficit, they need to pay fines. So you have a more balanced monetary union, so to speak. But again, you have the best of the two worlds, so to speak, as well, because you have still the national currencies. So uh, in essence, some countries could devalue their currencies if needed and you still have a, a common currency that you use in the trade between the different countries. Um, this is a, a, a more, bit more technical uh, scenario. Um, it is maybe the most symmetric scenario, the, the, fair, the fairest kind of uh, scenario, but it is technically and as well politically because Germany would be very reluctant to, to uh, um, be uh, inclined to say yes to this scenario, so it's, it's quite difficult. The third scenario that we are talking about is to actually go further in the integration of the euro, not going back, not trying to uh, exit from it or, 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 or kind of introduce the, the, the new national currencies, but to have a system where you, you continue in the uh, European integration, but apart from monetary integration, you have monetary integration, political and social integration. And to do that, you need to change radically some of the things that are happening right now in the monetary union. First, as I mentioned, you need a, a European centralized fiscal budget that can overcome asymmetric shocks in the union. To finance that budget, you need to generate um, uh, revenues from or around Europe through taxes. The financial transaction tax would be a good start to have this revenue uh, to, to, to create this budget. You need as well to, to issue euro bonds, so a combined euro bond that, that is an instrument of European debt that would certainly become a triple A uh, uh, security bond and that means that it would be cheaper for almost all countries and maybe even for Germany to, to create cheaper credit um, and to use this cheaper credit through the creation of a public development bank in Europe to, to use this, this credit to create infrastructure, to invest this money in, um, in, in, in uh, all sorts of projects that are, that are kind of uh, socially effective, that can be used um, for, for development, for research, etc. And, and you need as well to have a more political interference, control, uh, say in how the European Central Bank should operate. Uh, the European Central Bank should be um, under kind of the European Parliament and the European Parliament should tell the European Central Bank when it needs to operate in certain ways when you have a crisis like we, like we have today. So that you have politics again integrated in the whole monetary structure that we have right now. Thank you very much.